And I hope it's been helpful to you. I hope you've, you've, you've made a, a friend as I've introduced Borum to you. We left the Borums last time having just sent their acceptance letter to, to Tasmania and going to the tabernacle, the Baptist tabernacle where Borum served for 12, 10, 10 years. So he was eight years in Mosgill and 12 years in Tasmania, 10 years in Tasmania, I got that wrong again, and 12 years after that in, in Melbourne. He, um, he felt that Mosgill had really equipped him for his future ministry. He took with him a, you know, a lot of happy memories and two children. Got a picture of him again. We saw this last time. Hamish, we can lose these front lights. Nobody wants to see me anyway, and you'll see the photographs better. Um, it's the bottom switch on the, on the three. There we go. That's great. You can see everything fine. As long as I can still read my notes, then, then we're good. No, yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good. So along with all these happy memories, they've got two, two children. So Ivy Tyrini, who we met last time, and, and Stella Roxton. It's her middle name, so these two kids. And then a great deal of practical experience as well to take to his next pastor. And he felt that he was carrying what he called the luggage of life. And that became the title of one of his best-selling books. So 10 years Tasmania, 12 years in Armadale Baptist Church in Melbourne. And while he was in Melbourne, he also took a, a weekly lunchtime service at the Scots Presbyterian Church. And he carried on doing that until he was 84. So it was only 84 that he, um, he stopped that. They had three more children, a boy and two girls, and a photo of them later in life. There's Borum, Estella, and, and Frank Borum, and then the, the five kids. Now, he was very well loved as a pastor and incredibly well respected as a, as a preacher. And I want to think about his legacy under three headings, BWF. You turn it around, you've got FWB, Frank William Borum, so you remember that, BWF. The first one is books. On Sunday evenings, shortly after arriving in Tasmania, uh, Borum announced that he was going to preach a series on texts that changed the world. And he hoped that a lot more people would come than actually showed up. But the series became a book, a book called uh, A Bunch of Everlastings. When he retired, Borum and his wife went on a world tour and were preaching in America, Canada, and, and in England. And to his surprise, everywhere he went, he was welcomed by people who just loved his writing. And all across America, they'd been lapping up his books. In Canada, he was introduced to the congregation as Dr. F.W. Borum. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. I haven't got a, a PhD. And they said, don't worry, we're giving you one. <laughs> so from then on, he was Dr. Borum. And they gave him an honorary doctorate. And, and, and it just struck Borum that, you know, he'd been preaching to a, a relatively small congregation on Sunday evenings. But the effort that he'd put into the preparation had had a much deeper impact than he'd hoped. More people heard his sermons than he could have expected. And I was struck by the words 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. What are you doing for Jesus' kingdom that you feel is totally unappreciated where it's just not having that level of impact that you hope that it would? God knows and results belong to him. And it actually says right here in my notes, and perhaps it couldn't have been more relevant than any other Sunday night, there aren't many of us gathering on Sunday nights. We're a pretty small crew these days. But nobody knows how God will use the videos. And nobody knows what God might do where his word is open and his spirit is speaking. You think there was... One man started the China and Lamb Mission. There's one man that God used to set up orphanages in the UK and used George Muller powerfully and so many others. Who knows what God will do? One of our children, one of our adults, one of our elders. Where God's speaking, there's absolute hope. And, and for you, you too, 
you know, there might not be anybody paying attention to that line in the bulletin that says that you're on crash duty that morning. But who knows what God will do with the parents who you enabled to stay in the sermon. And perhaps nobody notices your effort in preparing for Bible in schools or in hosting a Bible study or in showing hospitality or investing in a local club or group. But who knows? how God will use your efforts 10, 20, 30 years from now. The one thing that we know with all certainty is that your labor is not in vain. In total, Borum wrote 55 books, just over 55 books. If you go to the Mosgill Library, you can see them. So just as you walk in through the doors, on the left is the F.W. Borum collection. And if you ask, they'll give you a key and unlock the cabinet and you can sit and flick through the books that they have. Many of his books are there. Now, if you want to know where to start because you'd like to read something by Borum, I started with, with this and they've been helpful. Just daily readings, little extracts from his writings. Otherwise, his biography, which is called My Pilgrimage, his autobiography called My Pilgrimage, uh, and otherwise, there's a, a kind of best of Borum collected essays called A Packet of Surprises. And that might be a good place to, to start. So there's the B of books. Now is the W of wisdom. Because F.W. Borum had a profound impact on a number of other ministers when he was invited to speak to an assembly of Presbyterian pastors in Scotland in 1936. This is how he was introduced. And now the man whose name is on all our lips whose books are on our shelves and whose illustrations are in all our sermons. And so he really had a, a wide-ranging, deep influence. His biographer, Howard Crago, said that wherever Borum's name was announced as preacher, people would flock to hear him. Many of the people whose books that we've read or we've been influenced by have have been influenced in turn by Borum. Warren Wearsby, let's go back, says, I trust a generation ignorant of Frank W. Borum has not arisen. So he's saying, I hope people don't not know this name. He's um, Ruth Graham. So Billy's wife said, I've all but two of Dr. Borum's books. He's my favorite author. I read a Borum book every year and will continue to do so for the rest of my life. And then the apologist Ravi Zacharias says, F.W. Borum is my favorite author. I try and read a chapter of Borum every day. So he usually begins his day reading a, a Borum essay. And so he's had this truly formative influence on many Christian leaders. And so I hope you're grasping from that. He's worth a bit of time. And if you're looking for somebody to read, here's somebody who's worth getting into. But that provokes the third letter, which is our F. And a big question, why then, if Borum has been so pervasive in his influence and had such a deep bearing on the lives of key people, why have so few of us heard of him? Especially some of us who have lived within two hours of Mosgill our whole lives. And my FN is forgotten. As I've been um, learning about F.W. Borum, and as I've been reading his stuff and working my way through biographies and through um, documentaries, I've just been waiting for something to crop up, you know, some moral failing or some theological problem, which would be the reason why we in our Reformed churches have kind of stepped back from this guy Borum. I haven't found it yet, not to say that it's not there, but I've had a good look. And so in the absence of that, I want to suggest four other reasons why I think Borum may have been forgotten. The first one is humility. There's a guy called Andrew Corbett who's responsible for an excellent series of documentaries on the life of Borum. It's called Navigating Strange Seas. That's what the webpage looks like. And there are five episodes and you can either buy it as a one-off for $1.49, that's not bad, or if you want to watch it more than once, then you can pay $5 and you can watch it as many times as you want. But they're, they're there. if you search the FW Borum story, you'll, you'll get this. And so if you want to know a bit more, especially as I haven't gone into detail on Tasmania and um, Melbourne then and that's there and the first two episodes are, are particularly good on on England and on Mosgill so anyway I got in touch with the guy who was responsible for this Andrew Corbett and I asked him you know why haven't we heard of Borum why is it that he's been forgotten and his first answer was well he was an incredibly humble man and when he said that I sniggered I was just like <laughs> 
you know, come on. Because John Bunyan was an incredibly humble man and John Newton was an incredibly humble man and William Carey was a humble man. And so, you know, we've, we've heard of these people. And so surely humility can't be the reason we haven't heard of Borum. What I didn't realize when I sniggered was how deep Borum's humility went. See, in, in New Zealand, when he was in Mosgill, Borum had a, a mentor. You remember him from our second session, J.J. Doak. And he became a missionary in Africa and was martyred in the Congo. When Doak left New Zealand, he left a big hole in Borum's life until he made friends with a man named John Broadbanks. And so John Broadbanks had a huge influence on Borum and comes across in his writing, and I read to you earlier that section, you know, it, it comes across, doesn't he, as an older man sharing with a younger man the years of reason and experience that he's, he's gained. And so Borum often writes about Broadbanks coming to visit him and encouraging him, challenging him. He would rebuke Borum about his ministry, or there was one time Borum writes about his marriage, struggling there, and, and Broadbanks coming in and, and telling him what he needed to do to fix it and how he needed to behave. And so he'd teach Borum things like an older man instructing a younger. Uh, and just there, you know, Borum's asking these questions, won't your congregation struggle a bit if they get a sermon like that? And Broadbanks replies, no, no, that's just what they need to fit them like a glove. The only problem with John Broadbanks was he didn't exist. He was Borum's literary invention so that he could criticize himself in his own writing. He made somebody up so that he could tell himself publicly where he was going wrong, rebuke himself, criticize himself, and, and, and teach. And it's incredible. And what's more, when Borum died, three things were discovered. Number one, there's a hospital in India called the John Broadbanks Dispensary. It's still open and running today. And it was totally funded by the proceeds from Borum's books. Number two, a whole wing of the Melbourne Hospital was paid for by Borum. And number three, when he went on holiday to the UK, you remember when the church paid for him to go? He preached at a a memorial service after Spurgeon's death, 10,000 people came to hear him preach. And when he came back to Mosgill, he didn't tell a single person. You know, the huge crowd had come to hear Borum. And yet when he came back, nobody knew. Now Sarah and I are going back to the UK in July. If I preach to 10,000 people, you will know about that before I finish the sermon. <laughs> This is a man whose only interest is in the renown of Christ. He's more interested in making a name for Jesus and preaching his name than making a name for himself. Now, I've heard it said that humility, I heard this recently, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking about yourself less. I don't think that's helpful at all, eh? Turn to Philippians chapter two. Here's where we meet true humility, and this is our instruction as we seek to be humble people and something that I think that Borum truly got hold of. Philippians chapter two. And verse five, I think I might have it up for us. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so Paul is writing to the Philippians and telling them, have this mind among you. Imitate Christ. Be like him. Don't put yourself first. Don't insist on your own rights and fill your mind with who Jesus is. That is the way to real humility. It's filling your mind with the awesomeness of who your Savior is. It's thinking. It's not about thinking less of yourself first and foremost. That's a really hard thing. We're never going to do that. 
what we need to do is think more of Christ so that all of our selfish aspirations seem so worthless in the light of who he is, I lose my appetite to pursue them and instead of wanting what I want, I want what he wants. I'm so struck with the beauty of Jesus and his love for me. It constrains me so that I love him more and love others more and think of them more than myself. See, I don't kill the vampire of my pride by going into the tomb where it lives and wrestling it until it's dead. I kill it by throwing open the curtains, exposing it to the light of who Jesus is. And I watch it shrivel up in his awesomeness. That's why we sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. And shrivel away. They'll seem so worthless. Your own gain and your own renown. What will that be when you capture something of the beauty of your Savior? It grows worthless and dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Borum did that genuinely humble man. And it may be one reason, I don't think it's the whole reason, but it may be one reason why so few of us know him today. But yet through his humility, millions of people have come to know Christ. And though he's unknown by us, God has made sure that certain people, perhaps some of the most influential Christians in the last 50, 100 years, have known this man. So Billy Graham. Think of all the people he preached to. Ravi Zacharias today reaching millions and millions of people around the world via the internet. Reason number two is ecumenism. When Borum had that accident, when he lost his leg, he was nursed by a, a Catholic lady. He, he really loved nurses. So those of you with nursing backgrounds, you would have got on very well with Borum. I want you to see what he said. He says, I can forgive any man for falling in love with a nurse. So he's on your side there, Hugh. He says, to tell the truth, I once fell in love with a nurse myself, but there were difficulties. To begin with, she was a devout and whole-souled Catholic, while I was to convince young Protestant. That was serious. And then to make matters worse, there was the minor circumstance that I was only 14 while she was over 40. Thus it came to pass that love's young dream was shattered. But to my dying day, I shall never forget that face in hours of anguish and delirium. It seemed to me like the face of an angel. And then this is interesting. He says, whenever I've been tempted to a too vigorous criticism of Roman Catholicism, I've been confronted by the imperishable memory of Sister Kathleen. She would have thought it heaven to lay down her life for her church or for her patients. Now it seems to me that what happened was Borum met this Catholic nurse who was a genuine believer in the Lord Jesus. And, and ever since then, he was very reluctant to be critical of Catholics. Now, that doesn't mean that he was going out of his way to, to work with Catholics. It doesn't mean that he was saying that all Catholics are, are believers. But he was perhaps a lot softer on Catholics than a lot of the men of the period who we'd respect would have been. Now today we want to work with anybody with whom we share common ground. But if you're a true Roman Catholic saying that you can be saved by praying to Mary or by anyone other than Jesus, you don't know my Jesus. It's a different God that you've got. And so maybe another reason why Borum isn't as well known as he could be. And the third one is irrelevant. Borum's first article when he wrote for the Otago Daily Times, it was written at the height of the Boer War, and he was encouraging young Kiwi men to go and fight for the empire in South Africa. He felt that the empire had to stand together. When the First World War erupted 15, 16 years later, again Borum encouraged young men to go and enlist, including those from his own parishes. But then two things happened. One, the reports of the fighting came back. Now the war had been advertised to young men as a great glorious adventure. The reality was mud, blood, poison gas, disease and death. 
And so it was touted as this, this great glorious affair and the reality hit home so hard when people found out what the young men had been suffering. The second thing that happened was the reports of the deaths started coming home. And the Australian government ordered that ministers were to deliver the telegrams in their parishes. And so in 1915, there was not a day of the year that Borum didn't work delivering telegrams to people around Hobart. And he had to visit elders from his church to tell them that the sons that he'd encouraged to go to war were never coming back. Now that experience changed Borum. And when the Second World War started, for all of his writing and for all of his preaching engagements, Borum didn't mention the war once. And to some that rendered him irrelevant. If you're not going to talk about the biggest things that are happening on the international scene, what have you got to say? And so instead Borum focused on what he called eternal things. He spoke about the eternal love of God and the eternal power of the cross. And it's hard, isn't it, to know where do you draw that line between speaking to the times and declaring eternal truths that are timeless and that the times need to hear. That's one thing that we know without a shadow of a doubt, that the eternal love of God and the eternal power of the cross, those things must be heard today more than ever. But there is a need for that to be contextualized in the world in which we live, only in as much as we need to speak to what's going on in the world around us. Because Borum refused to do that many saw him as irrelevant for his day but the fourth reason and you might think I'm being a bit romantic but I think that this is the most convincing of all is sovereignty you know I remember once sitting with my dad and watching a, a nature documentary I think I've told you this before about deep sea trenches and in these deep sea trenches, swimming around and crawling around are all sorts of amazing sea creatures that produce their own spectrums of light. And they're incredible things to look at. And it's just fascinating watching them. And I asked my dad, I said, if God made such amazing creatures, why did he put them down there where nobody could see them? And dad said to me, what are you talking about? You're looking at them right now. <laughs> it's incredible to think, isn't it, that after... However many thousands of years man has been admiring the, the created world. We're still finding things that are making us go, wow, isn't that incredible? And hasn't God done that on purpose? So that there never comes a point where we just say, oh yeah, well, we've come to the end of it and there's a limit on it. We're just, we're just blown away by the, the incredible unfathomable breadth of God's design and those creatures changing and adapting to he'll never come to an end and, and so it's like God is slowly still today revealing more and more of his brilliance and we know that God does that he loves to reveal things according to his perfect timing because the greatest example of that is his son Jesus Romans chapter 5 verse 6 so it's just at the right time when we were still powerless or while we were still weak at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. You know God concealed the mystery of his son of himself walking in our world until just the right time. And maybe even for you tonight. And I'm looking around at people I know well. I know I believe are saved people. But maybe tonight is the time God has brought you to for, for you to deal with him. And it's just the right time, the right moment to draw you to himself. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't miss your opportunity. I wonder, could it be that God allowed F.W. Borum, intended F.W. Borum to be forgotten to this day? Because he's more needed for another day. Forgotten in his day. 
because he's more needed for another day? Could it be that one generation forgot him so another generation could remember and own him and grab him? See, as we look at the church in New Zealand, isn't now the hour, perhaps more than ever, that we need homegrown heroes whose books we can read and whose lives we can imitate? Maybe God allowed his church to forget Borum so that you and I could meet him with the freshness of meeting somebody new, somebody we can lay our hands on and say, hey, this is our guy from Moskill. And we can learn from him and through his life and ministry grow to love the Lord Jesus more. Borum said, if scripture is more clear about one thing than about another, it is this. Heaven will perfectly satisfy all who reach it. 1959 he reached it and Borum went home to heaven but God's preserved his books Andrew Corbett who made those documentaries he's he's compiling these books and he set up a publishing company called the John Broadbanks Publishing Company and they're reprinting Borum's books and he said to me as he's, he's been working through all these old manuscripts because you remember Borum hated his typewriter and so wrote everything by hand he said he feels like Borum knew he was coming. He said as he looks through these documents, it feels like he knew that somebody was, was coming. It's all laid out. It's all ready to go. And so he's got this easy and enjoyable task of reprinting these books. And so you'll be able to find old titles republished again. And, and there are other ones that are still in print. If you want to read Borum, you can. Those documentaries are there. I hope it's been helpful to you to, to meet him and encouraging to see this man's life and above all his love for the Lord Jesus. We could maybe have a couple of minutes if anybody's got questions on Borum. I try to answer them. I try to wrap up most of the loose ends in that, in that last session. But if you have questions, go for it. Wow, it must have been thorough. They're not. Yep, yeah, no, none of his children survive today. Um, grandchildren he's got a, at least one grandson that I know of in Melbourne um, and, and fascinating that he, his grandson didn't know until he was dead that he had a wooden leg like he never even though it caused him pain all through his life he broke he, he, although he, he lost it from the knee down he, he broke the femur as, as well and so that's the big bone right see yeah and, and, and I think five times in his life it was just very weak and damaged his hip and so it caused him pain all his life but he, uh, he was quite quite embarrassed about that there's a beautiful section I actually read just the other day when he's talking about um, another another missionary with a, a physical ailment it wasn't David Brainer but somebody like that and he was just saying how these things are, are God's God uses them to pour grace into the life of his people and, and demonstrate that that he uses weak things and it's just lovely when you know the context of Borum hobbling around somewhere like Mosgill on one foot. But yeah. The Mosgill congregation aren't there anymore. Um, the the Mosgill Baptist Church, as it was, is now the Manor Christian School. And I think that's what it's called. You'd, is that the name of the school in Mosgill? Manor Christian School? Did Jesse go there? No, okay. So um, there's a school there. You can go and see the old um, outhouse building where people used to tether up their horses. That's still there. And attached to the more modern building is the old wooden front of the Mosgill Baptist Church as it was when, when Borum was there. Um, there are a few people around who know about the, the heritage. There's a guy called Laurie Rankin. Does anybody know that name? Nobody come across a Laurie Rankin. So he was the last pastor there. Um, and he's, I think he's um, at DCBC now, the church that's just the other side of Dunedin between Moscow and Dunedin Big Baptist Church. Um, but he'd be an older man now. But he, he certainly knows quite a bit about Borum and has a, a few books and so on. Yeah, I don't know. Because I, I don't use them, I didn't look into it. But I'm sure you could... Some of them, some of them, are, they must have been made, made into e-books. Really 
yeah it depends depends what you like from the bits that I've quoted would you say it was easy or intense readable <laughs> like it depends on your flavor it depends what like for some of you I've no doubt you would look at it and you'd be like this is flowery Victorian nonsense um, for me I love it I like poetry anyway and so I really love his his command of English language um, I'd prefer reading somebody like that to somebody like C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis has a beautiful command of English language, but he's very sterile with it. He's very much an academic, and so he writes like a professor, whereas Borum writes like a poet, and he's just got this beautiful command of the English language. So I could, I'd just sit there and read him all day long, but um, yeah. Tim, I just think of a southern hunter. You might look at this and think, what, what, what is this? But um, like the, the, the way to go is something like this then and just short extracts. And if you, can, if you can get into reading what he's saying in that, then, then the essays would be no problem. Yeah. Otherwise, his, his, yeah, his biography by Howard Crago might be a better way to go. Read somebody else writing about him. Okay, well, if you've got other questions, you can always ask me afterwards. Alison mentioned this, this final hymn to me on Wednesday night, and I thought it was a beautiful way for us to, to close this little mini-series on Borum because it's not about exalting a man. We're grateful to the God who, who raised up and used this man and who's still at power to work in the world today to raise up his servants and use them for his mighty purposes. So let's finish by giving glory to our God and sing how good is the God we adore. Faithful, unchangeable friend. Let's sing. <laughs>